50, CO2 is 52. Oh, she's acidotic. Medical, medical. All right, I'm performing a gastrotomy. Medical, medical. The hippo came back to me. Medical, medical, medical. Throw a horizontal mattress stitch. I'm going to take a medical, and then I'm going to medical his medical. A ring fracture almost always causes the dora to tear. Medical, no, the medical. Medical, medical. If we just keep throwing in stitches, she'll dissect all over the place. Quick, medical, medical. Super dire medical. She needs a medical, medical, and then we need to go over there and medical, medical. We go straight down the barrel of the hippocampus. Super dire medical. Medical. Blood with medical all over the medical. Figure out how you're going to get these bastards out of my noggin. Uh, medical medical is what the writers use before the medicine gets filled in. But before we know what that information is and we're just writing the script, it literally will say, Derek, hand me the medical medical. I didn't realize that was just a placement for something else. I was like, is this really the way that doctors talk to one another? And then Zoanne and the researcher and our consultants will help fill in the scene. Zoanne Clack, who is a doctor and a writer. She, a, she was a writer on um, the show from season one, and we're in season going to season 11, and she's still a writer on the show. She's now an executive producer writer, but she's been a writer on the show all this time. The researcher will do a lot as far as like finding cases. They go through and scour through all the medical journals, and actually a lot of people will send them just medical stories that they think are interesting. Super valvular mitral ring and parachute. Shown's complex? Bingo. Poor Zoanne has to crawl through the script and medically illuminate with real terminology exactly what's happening. Sometimes we're like, we want this, this, and this to happen with our characters. What kind of medical story can we tell? He has situs inversus? All his organs are completely backwards, mirrored to the normal position. I have wanted to see this since med school. I know that. The medical team from the writers uh, offices uh, meet with Linda Klein, our medical technical advisor, who has to actually take what's written and make it applicable. Linda Klein's a genius. Linda Klein is a genius. Make sure you put that in there. I'd say half the time, all the medical terminology and how things would have to happen physically are not in the script. I get a script and I read the script and I make notes. I have no medical background. And notes. I don't know anything about medicine. And notes. Oh well, yeah, I wrote an ER script when I was like 12. <laughs> and I tell them, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then I basically, we work it out somehow. Work with Linda as a director is crazy because you'll do a whole rehearsal with Linda and you'll be like, okay, this is what we're gonna do, this is what we're gonna do. And then on the day, she'll come in and say, no, that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> you know crazy Klein chaos that we like to do. We call it getting Klein. <laughs> She's very good about telling you the very specific thing you should do and the things that, the ways that you should not deviate from her plan. And woe to you if you do. <laughs> She's unbelievable. I think Linda had about a 25 year career or so as a surgical nurse and uh, she brings a wealth of information and knowledge and experience to our show. I, I often kid with Linda, Believe it or not, Grey's Anatomy is not a medical show. It's more a soap opera, and it's about people's relationships, and she refuses to believe that. <laughs> you know, I try hard. I fight the fight. Sometimes I don't win. You know, this is the most time we spend together, just the two of us, in weeks. It's really nice. We have to do it more often. The really intense medicals are the ORs, um, where you know we go through the scene, we go through the words. We're usually in the same spots because we're over the body. Linda kind of takes a step by step on how you exit. How am I supposed to hold the pickups in a certain way, and then this bovi, how you how you're supposed to hold it. She will um, talk through exactly what the procedure is that we're doing, and exactly what um, what the suction is suctioning, and how the stitches are going in, and we've had to practice the suturing. All of the work that we do is choreographed. Um, a lot of times we have to choreograph it with a word in order for the word to stick. Like there are all these kind of games that we have to, to play with ourselves. Just the ballet of putting the glove, getting the gown on and putting the gloves on right and getting the tie to the person who's gonna tie the thing and hold the way you hold the instruments, it's it's way more difficult than anyone would imagine. Actual scalpels, actual tools, um, forceps retractors, lap pads, all that stuff is exactly as it would be. Yeah, it's, it's all real. The only thing that's fake is us. <laughs> 
you go in and, and depending on whatever the shot is, she will yell from <laughs> Video Village <laughs> while you're doing it, what you're doing wrong or where your hand should be. Or, and you feel, I think maybe some people would feel attacked. I feel taken care of, personally. I love hearing her raspy voice <laughs> yelling at me from Video Village. Like, I know that I'll be doing the right, the right thing. <laughs> You, know, you figure out how you're, what it's supposed to look like, and then they help make, then you try it, and then they help make adjustments, and then you do it. But I mean, then you do silly things. Like, I think I wore my stethoscope backwards for like three seasons before my own pedi pediatrician said to me, you know you wear your stethoscope backwards on the show, right? I didn't know that. <laughs> that was embarrassing. <laughs> Take a deep breath. All right, so today's gonna be a piece of cake. We're gonna stage the tumor, do a biopsy, and then we'll come up with a treatment plan. While story is exciting, the medicine also has to be accurate in order for that exciting stuff to make sense. And the researchers really spend a lot of time, you know, calling around and talking to doctors and spending time talking to specialists who do really interesting things. When I first started, I was sort of worried that I would mess something up, but we, we do vet it. We vet it through so many surgeons. We vet it through Zoanne and different consultants. We also have a researcher who's always coming up with very inventive and strange real medical stories that we can hopefully base things on. We'll be on the phone with the doctor. We'll ask, can this happen? They say, yeah, maybe it's a one in a million kind of thing. And we're like, great, great, that's what we want. <laughs> we really take our responsibility um, very seriously. We are constantly in the room saying, OK, if we tell this story, what is that going to do to the world? Like, for instance, we've never told a suicide story yet because we have not figured out how it's not going to engender copycats and, and that sort of thing. Anorexia, we kind of told once, but still not in the way we would like to. Childhood obesity, which there's a lot of things that we haven't been able to address yet because we don't know how to address it without affecting the public health. These men and women who we, we put our, our lives in their hand uh, uh, have a lot of knowledge. Uh, they bring some expert minds into play and we try and just replicate that. Uh, we try and make sure that when we, we say it, that, that there's some terminology out that we, we say it right, that we, we, we sound like we know what we're doing, what the function is behind that. We try, seriously, try so hard because you don't want it to be, you, I've seen some of those shows and you look at them and you don't want them to be a show where the medicine is a joke. Somebody called me and it turned out that their brother had a, the same brain tumor that we used, and we used an instrument called a Cusadrill. And I hooked her up with some neurosurgeons, and they uh, operated on her brother, and her brother did fine. So I take uh, a lot of pride in what we do, and I feel like we have a message to give to the public, and, you know, we have to stand by it. There's a hole in the pericardium. That's the source of all this blood? No, that's what's keeping him alive. It depends on what we're actually doing with the organs, um, but it's probably a split 50-50 that we actually use uh, real organs that are cow hearts or pig hearts or, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, but if we have to cut things and, and, you know, manipulate them a lot, will have prosthetic uh, parts made. We have a lot of different organs that we use on the show, obviously mm, animal. Um, and um, they always are pretty good stand-ins. Um, it's, usually it's a lot of like muscle, tissue, it's a lot of, we've got a lot of hearts that we work on. They use some animal product, yeah, and early on, uh, so the animal intestines, or they'll put a piece of steak in there. We actually used a little, uh, we used a little I don't even know what it was. I think it was actually a steak <laughs> for uh, the plane crash when Arizona's leg uh, breaks. And we revealed the, the bone has come through the, the pants and the leg, and that was a mistake to make that look real. <laughs> I was eight months pregnant with, with a broken leg lying on the ground with steak coming out of my pants. <laughs> We have some very interesting bowel material now that's kind of this plastic, squishy, blah, blah, blah. But in the beginning, it was always chitlins. I don't understand why the chitlins didn't get cleaned before we used chitlins, but we would <laughs> like these dirty chitlins. I just 
just take after take after take and light after light, heat after heat, the chitlins would just start stinking up a storm. Working with animal organs for too long uh, does create a very specific uh, olfactory experience <laughs> that most people don't find pleasant. We had a bowel sequence that the bag of bowels was opened up and the stages were cleared for about an hour. <laughs> it was not pretty. <laughs> the texture of a chitlin is totally different than what we have now, but I appreciate not having the smell. <laughs> San Francisco's Spockin. They've grounded all commercial flights for at least another couple of hours. Well, he's getting worse. I don't think that he has that kind of time. Let's go. Practical know-how. I don't think I've acquired any practical know-how. It goes in, it goes out. This stuff for me goes in one ear and out the other. I think I could put stitches in someone. <laughs> would you trust me? <laughs> the cast, who honestly, I think, in a pinch, I would probably let operate on me. Oh, God. <laughs> well, definitely brain surgery with my McDreamy is always good. No. <laughs> no. I always say to myself, I hope to God nobody comes up to me and say, I know you play a doctor, but somebody's having a heart attack. Or I'm like, oh, God, no. I, I don't want to kill him. People say, oh, you must really feel like you can, you know, do some surgery now. No. Um, people feel like, oh, the terms come to you so easily. No. I feel like I could maybe intubate somebody in real life. We're given definition sheets at the beginning of each episode with the medical terms spelled out phonetically with the meanings, and so we can familiarize ourselves with those terms. CBC is Cool Boys Club. <laughs> a whip stitch. A whip stitch, um, you do whip stitches, at least on this show, we do whip stitches on the heart. D a, a stitch. <laughs> <laughs> a whip stitch is uh, when your patient is misbehaving and you have to slap them before you actually go in there and do the business. Maybe you st stitch it twice, same stitch. Is that it? I think it's like, it's just a really, is it the really the fastest kind of, I don't know. A whipple, a whipple is uh, like, <laughs> Ten years of this. I'm still struggling to put my gloves on right, so. I have no idea what a Whipple is. No idea. Endoscopy. Um, mm-hmm. It's like a little light that you can put into a... Yeah, I don't know. You see, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Yeah, I don't know what that is. A central line is like when all of your auras are aligned, and then you've achieved nirvana. I know what the thrombin is, the little jelly foam pads, <laughs> right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. If you need it, I'm the wrong person to come to. Well, you know, I taught them all how to do it, so they're all pretty good. <laughs>